Good morning and thank you for joining. We're going to give it another minute or so as more people are coming in and the waiting room is actually in effect today. So I will keep funneling people in as they show and then we'll kick it off. We did just get a message from a uh, former commodity trader in London today, and uh, they were anticipating jumping on this as well. It wasn't Boris Johnson, was it? Negative, <laughs> it, it was not. <laughs> okay. And then my mouse has disappeared. There we go. We'll give it another minute or so. Oh, here we go. As people come in and get situated, set up. Eileen, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. I haven't seen you in a while. I know it's been a while. I saw on LinkedIn this uh, this post, and I was like, I'm going to join. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, what what are you? Where are you now? In Ottawa? Um, no, I actually moved back to Niagara, um, and I worked at the Niagara site for a bit, and then I transitioned, and now I'm working for a consulting company. <laughs> Great. Yeah. The exciting stuff. Where are you now? Yeah, so we're just waiting for a few more people to come in and then we will start. Right on. I reckon that we go ahead and get off and people will still filter in through the time. So very excited to be here and have you all join us. There were lots and lots of people who signed up, but then again, you know, things happen. So we'll adjust. But to be quite transparent, this will be recorded or excuse me, is being recorded and we'll put it up so that you can come back and revisit these things and you know request for more resources. Thrilled to have you all here. And this is actually our second session. Um, so we do plan to have a couple more, but today using risk optimization to help cannabis business build investor confidence. So three of those particular takeaways 
are the due diligence, you know, from both parties, the investors as well as the operators, and what the operators can do to help enchant the investors, and vice versa to the investors to understand what they want and need to look for through the particular processes and the tools to validate these particular things, as well as what is needed to help empower the investors to understand what is truly happening in the trenches. Uh, today, we have uh, Victor Muliel and Robert Thomas with us, and they've industry experts for a long time. And me, myself, I've been in this business for about five years, but about seven years ago, got diagnosed with adult epilepsy. So it's very close to my heart as well as my noggin and what is happening here and why I'm so fascinated and thrilled by it. But uh, I'll pass the floor over to Victor and we'll get going. Hey, thanks, Trevor. Well, I know some of you have, have groups uh, listening in, so I just want to make sure that uh, oh, we have a few more coming in. So I just want to make sure that you know we can everybody can hear us okay and see the slides okay. So if you if you don't, please raise your hand, or if you have a question uh, or a comment to make please either raise your hand or unmute your mic and speak directly into the conference. But if we would prefer that you raise your hand so we, we can track who needs to talk. Okay. So the title of today's presentation is more geared towards investment into the cannabis sector and the retaining of investment in the cannabis sector, whether it be domestic uh, or global. So uh, one of the interesting developments uh, just recently is that Germany has moved to um, legalize recreational cannabis use and Thailand has decriminalized possession of cannabis. So there's a lot of, a lot of movement in the industry. And of course, uh, companies, uh, countries like Panama, Peru, Ecuador are moving quickly uh, to, to increase cannabis production capability. So one of the things we look at is how can we help cannabis businesses build investor confidence and avoid some of the pitfalls in investing in cannabis in the cannabis sector. And we'll clarify what risk optimization actually is and how it can help in this, in this respect. Next slide, please. So to attract and retain investors is one thing. To attract and retain a savvy investor is another. A lot of investors talk about doing due diligence on, um, on their candidates for investment, but a lot of them don't understand what due diligence actually means. And due diligence is more than believing the hype. So you have to look at the nuts and bolts of a, can uh, a company to figure out whether it can withstand some of the, um, some of the storms that are gonna hit the cannabis sector, especially in the US as it moves from uh, state by state legislation into potentially federal, and also when you look at moving towards uh, global trade. So a lot of, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, movement now is to understand not only what's happening now, what's going to happen in the future, but learn from the past. So the three focus, focal points here is learn and reconsider, then innovate and fast track so that you can build a business quickly that will respond to changes in a very straightforward, but a very quick and streamlined manner. And then streamline and sustain your business, which will, again, not only uh, retain investors, but attract new ones. Because motiv the motivation for investment is often jumping on the bandwagon when something is already gone, uh, proven to be successful. And some of you have been in the cannabis industry for a while, so you know the ups and downs. So one of the things we are gonna look at is the pitfalls that we've addressed in the past and how to avoid them in future. So learn from cannabis history and avoid these pitfalls if you wanna sustain your business. And investors, when you're looking to invest, make sure that due diligence is not just a term, that you actually understand from experience what you're getting into and don't believe the hype. 
you know, that a lot of, there'll be a lot of hype, a lot of, uh, I know everything, a lot of, you know, why don't you join this association because they've got a checklist. Uh, those are, those are wonderful things to look at, but if you don't understand the underlying uh, rigor of what's going on, you won't be able to sustain the investment. The second part is moving quickly to streamline your business, but moving quickly to innovate as well so that you can build sustainable systems. Nobody wants to wait forever to implement a system. Management and investors want to see something as soon as possible. But at the same time, they want something that's sustainable and streamlined. So it's a tricky tightrope that we're walking here. They, they don't want to wait forever for you to figure out what to do with your business. You have to have techniques available that you can demonstrate right away in order to get these investors online. So use advanced effective training techniques for not only your own people, but also to educate investors, to educate customers, to educate uh, regulatory agencies. Then use what's available to streamline and fast track. So use toolkits if they're available for rapid system implementation. Don't start from scratch without knowing what you're doing and then try to build a system. This is when you get into trouble because you believe everything you hear. What you have to look at is what is actually being offered in and what's the outcome of what's being offered. Has it been tried before? Has it been tested before? Has it worked? And then once you've got that system built, make sure you get management buy-in because if you don't get management buy-in, it's not going to sustain the system. In order to get management to buy-in, you have to integrate your system. You can't have multiple systems and say, we need one for the US, one for Canada, one for Panama, one for Colombia, one for Germany, one for Thailand. You can't do that. Management will never buy into something like that. But what will end up happening is you won't comply with any of them. And you'll build a system that will be subject to rejection at any given point. And that will um, make your investors very ed edgy. So learn and reconsider what you're doing. Make sure you've got the, the background and learn from the past. Innovate and fast track to, to give your investors something to bite into quickly, but also build it in a way it can be streamlined to sustain and optimize your resources so you won't get sidetracked at the first sign of trouble or the first sign of challenge. So something like COVID or something like a, a, a border closure won't sidetrack you because you have the tools to prepare for that in advance. Next slide, please. So what's happened in the legalized cannabis industry? Well, one of the, one of the big uh, models up obviously is Canada that legalized in 2017. They've been on it for a while. And some of you are from the Canadian cannabis sector. You know what the history is. Um, so cannabis producers and distributors have, were looking for a pathway to implement, but there was no guidance. There was no legalized at least guidance. There were a lot of characters coming up from the woodwork saying, I know what I'm doing. And businesses hired consultants, usually from the food industry or the pharmaceutical industry, mostly from the food industry, unfortunately, to become their experts, so-called experts. What that did was design systems that weren't targeted to cannabis, wasted resources, were non-compliant, resulted in non-compliant systems. Uh, for instance, I sat on the, the approval committee of one of the largest uh, cannabis distribution organizations in Canada. And one of the things we found was out of 600 plus submissions, we approved just over 80. So you can look at the amount of rejected work out there. And all of these people paid for consultants, paid thousands, tens of thousands in some cases of dollars to get consultancy that was not effective. Why wasn't it effective? Because the systems weren't customized to the cannabis sector. They, weren't, they didn't have the experience to customize to the cannabis sector, nor were they prepared for global markets. So some of the, some of the uh, exporters to Europe, especially to Malta, to Germany and countries like that, 
uh, were confused as to the requirements that led to poor imp implementation. And eventually they lost market share both domestically as well as for the import export markets. So when you, when you lose market share, investors drop out. And in, when investors drop out, when the investment dries up, you have a for sale sign on your lawn. Small medium companies became the target of undervalued takeovers and the industry consolidated. And as some of you can attest, it became a, a, um, a playing field with very few large players in it. And as a result, anything that was badly done was propagated by these large companies. They didn't want to innovate. They used what they already knew. They didn't want to change. So as a result, even those big companies now are having serious financial difficulties or difficulties attracting and retaining investors. So we need to learn from all of this to avoid the same pitfalls in the US or in Latin America moving forward. Next slide, please. So how do you avoid these historical pitfalls? Well, building efficient, sustainable business growth is the goal of any business. The problem with most businesses is they don't have the proper guidance to get there, to actually take control of their systems. To take control of a system, you have to understand your system, whether it be safety or quality system, and it has to be targeted to the cannabis sector what you're actually doing. In order to do this, you have to use true experience, get cannabis focused training and use ready to use tools, not only for the implementation. You know, a lot of people give, say they have ready to use tools and all they give you is a bunch of forms. Well, the forms don't help you if you don't know what you need and how that form will, will affect your, your own business. So what you need to do, first of all, is do a gap assessment for your own business. Understand what you need and where you need to streamline, where you need to speed up, and then get the templates and tools to do it properly. So we'll explain what some of the tools available are to do this. And then the next step is to make sure that your system uses your resources wisely. Because one of the biggest problems with any business, again, is spinning your wheels where there's no value, where there's no effect on what you're doing. So you need to streamline your system. That will, that will achieve management buy-in as well, because management can make sense out of how does this translate into dollars and cents? How do I know I'm using my money wisely? And they will then relay that to investors. How do you know that your investment is being used wisely? And how do you know that you're not going to lose it tomorrow? Optimizing resources is one aspect, but there's another aspect to streamlining a business, and that is you may need to meet multiple regula regulatory environments. So you may need domestic, you may need statewide, state-to-state uh, -state differences in regulations, uh, export regulations, et cetera. You need to integrate those requirements in order to achieve streamlining in your system, not have multiple systems because that leads to a terrible confusion internally. The good, part, the good thing to understand out of all this, the good news is that a lot of these systems are actually uh, based in common requirements. And if you, if you make people understand that you've got a handle on risk and sustainability, and that you have the expertise to run a good, well-managed business that's sustainable, you will, allow, you will overcome a lot of these uh, variances in market requirements. And then what you can do is once you've got a streamlined, consistent, integrated system, you can then just focus on a few little nuances from market to market. Say the US needs this or, or California versus Michigan needs this, Canada needs this, Germany needs that. But those are nuances. Most of the requirements are, uh, if you look in depth into them, they're common and they're related to uh, feed safety and quality systems that are sustainable and demonstrable. So one of the things also you have to do is 
not only know that you've developed a good system, but show your system, have the toolkits to demonstrate your system to all these external parties, investors included. Next slide, please. Victor, real quick, um, regarding streamline, that's a term that we keep seeing pop up heavily it, and is another way to consider streamlining uh, to look at the available hours as well as the required hours. Yeah, and actually we, we use a term called RPH and, and APH, the required personnel hours, available personnel hours. We have a technique that actually allows you to link that into risk assessments and then plan your resources accordingly. Not just, just by you know, guessing what the time frame is, but actually allocating uh, hours to each control task. So that will that's like a Six Sigma type uh, approach to the business, but at the same time, it gives business investors a lot more confidence in what you're doing. It says this is not a fly by night thing. They've really given it some thought. They really understand how this is going to sustain, and management also understands that language. Does that answer your question? I, I think it does. Uh, some of these are from. Uh... Uh, individuals present as well as some that may not have been present uh, but are really looking forward to a glass of wine and watching this later <laughs> or a cannabis joint Th there you go <laughs> <laughs> so there are certain steps to build a sustainable cannabis business these are these seem obvious but they're uh, they're enhanced by toolkits and and um, streamlined learning methods. So there are three phases to this is design, implement and communicate. So in order to design properly, you have to research and identify both safety hazards, cannabis safety hazards, as well as business hazards. Business hazards would be things like resistance to export, you know, uh, closure of borders because of something like COVID. Those aspects would not directly relate to cannabis safety, but could affect your business nonetheless. And this would re relate to suppliers, transport and drivers, premises, pests, personnel and investors, um, uh, sorry, visitors, as well as manufacturing and markets. So all of these components, we, we have templates that, that will um, allow you to identify the, the risks associated with each of these. And some of these templates are pre-filled, which will uh, enable you to get a kickstart on what you're doing. And then you, need, you can then uh, customize them to your needs. Risk assess hazards to prioritize resources and tasks related to controls, validation and monitoring. And we give you tools to optimize your resources to the, the risks. So if you run out of time, you're not running out of time on something that will negatively affect your business significantly. You're running out of time on minor stuff. But in order to, to, to achieve that, you have to know where the big stuff is and be, be able to target your resources accordingly. And we give you tools as well as techniques to do that. We give you actual um, electronic templates that will allow you to, to analyze those, those uh, resource optimization targets. Then we establish control tasks, assign these to personnel, and develop policies and procedures. And we do this, we help you with this by um, things like e-learning tools, uh, using multimedia training, changing the dynamics of how you train to make it more effective and more easily uptaken, easier to translate. I know some of you are from Latin America. Um, so you can, you can easily translate to French, to Spanish, to, to German, to Thai, you know, because they're, they're, they're media based. So you, you can use an audio track that's customized with the same visual media. And then use advanced training techniques that will enable you to uptake these faster and, and avoid using these gigantic manuals that nobody reads and looks good on paper and consultants get paid thousands of dollars to develop these. And then they sit uh, what I call trophy, trophy manuals. They sit on your, and the, a lot of you know, um, you, you hear, heard me say this before, but trophy manuals that sit on your shelf and get dusted every six months, nobody opens them. You know, use video tools. How do you learn nowadays? Well, you go to YouTube, 
and you figure out how to do something. That's the same principle you should be using internally. But what we do is we show you how to customize these videos, how to make sure that you use multimedia effectively and not just uh, in a way that's, that's, uh, that's gonna create more, uh, more cumbersome information. Next slide, please. So risk optimization can help investors as well as companies by teaching you what to look for as an investor in a company, how to get to the core of the sustainability use and by looking for tools that they can demonstrate to you. And from a company standpoint, we show we give you the tools and the techniques to demonstrate what you're doing to investors. So design training and systems to maximize understanding, focus on risk reduction and increase market access, and then improve your return on investment through streamlined systems and targeted audits. So you understand how not only how to develop your system in a streamlined way, but how to review it in a streamlined way. Next slide, please. Okay. What we call fast track is a toolkit technique based approach using global experience in cannabis focused systems training, implementation and auditing. We use expert training, but translate it into a way that you can use and understand properly. It's expert doesn't mean uh, train in a, uh, like a PhD thesis where nobody can understand what you're saying. Expert means being able to translate complex situations into easy to understand, sustainable uh, teaching methods. Then use these toolkits and templates to speed up not only the implementation, but maintain the consistency of the application of the, these controls. That way you build a streamlined integrated system that's including domestic and global requirements in a, a, a concise integrated platform that you can work with day to day and actually sustain day to day. And then communicate these uh, using tools that we provide to you internally as well as uh, externally. What we give you is a tool to build a, what's called a site master plan, but we build it in a way that the site master plan isn't just a description, isn't just a standard. It's enhancing what you do and showing the superiority of your approach to external parties. So when you're writing a resume, for instance, if you just put your, your experience down and your work history, you're in a pile with a thousand other applicants. But if you say to them, here's what I can do. This is what I can do for you. And this is the way I do it. And you can summarize that in a very brief, concise manner. Then you'll be put into a prefer preferential pile. You'll be put into a preferential category so that then this applies to investors as well as to regulatory agencies, because all we, regulatory agencies have a, an algorithm to determine risk associated with the companies they are inspecting or auditing. So the, the better prepared you are to meet the regulations sustainably and be able to demonstrate how your system can be sustainable in meeting their requirements, the less likely you are to be detained or in, have business interruptions or supply chain interruptions. Next slide, please. So why should you choose the ROC approach. The ROC is the Risk Optimization Resource Center. It's a group of people that are qualified to do this, this type of approach in multiple countries and will continue to get updated feedback from uh, the ROC in general to make sure that they are implementing this consistently. This leverages over 35 years of global training and system implementation, as well as audit experience, including proven cannabis sector experience, which a lot of people don't have or cannot demonstrate. It includes consistent, proven, virtual or in-person training, leading to what's called a lead implementer certificate, either level one or level two, depending on the amount of workshops and practical that you do. And that allows you also to have a consistent methodology to demonstrate 
cannabis specific training to uh, external parties, as well as internally to your management. And the risk optimization fast track uh, tools and techniques have already been implemented in the cannabis industry, not only domestically in Canada and the US, but also in other countries such as Panama, Peru, uh, Germany, Malta, and in, in certain cases in, um, in the new developments in Africa. So there's been a lot of implementation. It's all been successful. And you'll see as soon as you start to work with this system, how well it integrates all your requirements. Next slide, please. There are some basic pillars around which this uh, system focuses, and that is advanced, we train you how to do advanced hazard analysis, risk assessment, and establish control tiers to which you can uh, target your implementation. It gives you tools to not only monitor your supply chain, uh, but also to monitor and demonstrate your internal cannabis safety and quality system. And we use a, what called us a monitoring scorecard uh, to do this. We show you how to do advanced corrective actions and tiered root cause analysis, again, to avoid repetition of, of non-conformances or, or, or deficiencies. How to audit your system effectively and sustainably. And then finally, how to get senior management to buy in by training them as well as showing them how to track the business effectively and efficiently. This will give you, so and we do this through targeted training and customized toolkits for each of these, these pillars. Next slide, please. So risk optimization is your pathway to, to global success, not only as a cannabis producer or distributor, but also as a cannabis investor because we give you the tools to look diligently at companies and really protect your investments and grow them. We do this through the building of integrated systems, through giving toolkits that allow rapid deployment or fast track, and then effective training and assessment techniques using multimedia training, using uh, optimized training, and also risk-focused assessments. Learner, the training is learner focused. The gap assessments are done by cannabis experts that know not only the technical aspects of this, but also uh, regulatory or challenges to avoiding pitfalls and how to overcome them. And finally, there are toolkits and templates surrounding all of this to allow you to build an efficient system quickly and sustain it effectively. So that concludes my part in this presentation. And I, I would encourage anybody who has questions to follow up on this presentation and we can do one-on-one -on -one, uh, discussions on how risk optimization can fast track your investment um, oversight, as well as if you're, if you're a cannabis producer or distributor, how to attract and sustain investment. Thanks Trevor, next slide. So I'll turn it over now to Robert Thomas, who will continue the rest of this presentation. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Victor. Excellent. Okay. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, if you're in another part of the world. Uh, my name is Robert Thomas, and I run my own educational consulting company, and I focus on heavy metal measurements. Um, a little bit about my background. Um, I've spent the past 50 years in the field of trace element analysis, so that gives my age away a little. Um, but I came to the US in 1987, having worked in the UK for Perkin Alma, large analytical instrumentation company. And um, I came to work for Perkin Alma in the UK, and I focus on applications for inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. Um, I found my way to the cannabis industry about three years ago, having spent the past 20 years working in trace element analysis in the pharmaceutical sector. So um, I bring a lot of pharmaceutical experience 
to this industry, and in particular, um, the best way to monitor heavy metal contaminants and trace element impurities in the cannabis consumer products. So this talk is more educational than anything else. Um, I've given it a number of times. Um, and uh, it, is, it is basically looking at regulations that the pharmaceutical company took almost 20 years to adopt with a lot of headaches and a lot of heartaches in between. But um, in 2018, they came out with comprehensive elemental impurities in pharmaceutical products based on a risk assessment strategy. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about that. But initially, I wanna discuss the fractured nature of state-based regulations in the US because um, they have taken regulations, um, obviously based on where the cannabis consumer product in what state it's made, and um, they have not taken the advice of the pharmaceutical industry and each state has come up with its own regulations. And when I first came into the industry three years ago, I was staggered by the lack of consistency amongst different states. So this, uh, this presentation is mainly education in nature to tell you a little bit about the problem of heavy metal contaminants in consumer products, but also looking at the fractured nature of state-based regulations. So let me first give you a brief overview of my talk. Okay, next slide, please. So um, I'll kick off with the current status of heavy metal regulations for cannabis and hemp, particularly the limitations of a state-based system. I'll then focus on how the pharmaceutical and dietary supplement industries approach regulating element and impurities and how they abandon the 100-year-old semi-quantitative colorimetric method for lead and replaced it with plasma spectrochemistry. I'll also offer my perspective on what the cannabis industry can learn from this process and give my thoughts on how the industry should move forward with federal oversight sometime around the corner. Next slide, please. And just a, just a reminder for our audience here and those that will be audience members later about how valuable this is to the due diligence of investing, whether we're doing seed funding raising or we're part of the investors putting uh, some funding forward, as well as the tools to uh, validate. When we're talking about validation, we're talking about uh, the proof and then the empowerment for both sides, as well as the investors and the operators. A great point. Um, so where is cannabis legal in the US today? Here's a map of the US with light green representing states where medicinal cannabis is legal and dark green where both recreational and medicinal is legal. It is legal for both medicinal and recreational use in 37 states with 18 of them allowing for medical use. Most of the 37 states have heavy metals limits majority of the states just specify four heavy metals known as the big four, lead, cadmium, arsenic, and mercury. While New York adds nickel, chromium, antimony, zinc, and copper, Maryland and a few other straight states adds chromium. However, Michigan also includes inorganic arsenic as well as chromium, copper, and nickel. And Michigan are the only states that require inorganic arsenic. Um, so I'm not too sure why that is the case. Oregon up to now has no heavy metal limits at all, but I'm told that come January 2023 that they will have heavy metals limits and it will be the big four. So my question is, what does New York State know that the other states don't know that they regulate an additional five elements? And what does Maryland know about chromium that other states don't know? So to me, it's mystifying that each state has its own requirements and there's no consistency across state lines. And next slide, please. This is a table of heavy metal maximum limits for seven different states, California, Colorado, Oregon, Maryland, New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. Compared to the United States Pharmacopeia, chapter 232 permitted daily exposure limits for elemental impurities in drug products. USP chapter 2232, PDE limits for dietary 
supplements, and the American Herbal Pharmacopeia limits for heavy metals in botanicals and herbal products. A few points to emphasize. USP chapter 232 defines a total of 24 elemental impurities based on the drug delivery method, which is oral, parenteral, inhalation, or transdermal, while chapter 2232 only defines the big four heavy metals in dietary supplements. So in this table, nine of those elements have been included to reflect the big four, plus the additional elements regulated in New York, Maryland, and Michigan. It's also important to emphasize that chapter 232 limits in this table are based on micrograms per day. So to know what is allowable in the actual drug supplement, drug or supplement, these limits must be recalculated based on the suggested daily dosage for the drug or supplement. For example, if the maximum dosage is 10 grams per day, these limits must be divided by 10 to convert to microgram per gram in the drug. So let's take a closer look at three of those states, which emphasizes the inconsistencies of the regulations. Next slide, please. California was the first state to regulate cannabis in 1996. And as a result, this considered the gold standard with regard to cannabis regulations. California limits are defined in microgram per gram in two different categories, inhalation cannabis products and all other cannabis products. So these are the same as USP chapter 232 PDE limits for inhale and oral drugs respectively based on 10 grams per day. However, it's worth pointing out that even though typical pharmaceutical PDEs are based on 10 gram of maximum doses per day, we really have no way of knowing in what quantities people consume cannabis products. Another point to emphasize is that California requires a minimum of a half a gram for carrying out the heavy metal determinations, whereas most other states do not have this stipulation and lower weights are allowed. Next slide, please. Here are the limits for Colorado, which are a little more complex than California. Colorado limits are categorized by heavy metals of interest in the first column, acceptable limits in the second column, and products to be tested in the third column. The acceptable limits are defined in part per million in the product and not microgram per gram. Besides inhale and oral, they also include limits for transdermal products by the skin. The limits for inhaled products are based on USP chapter 232 limits for inhalation drugs, but the limits for oral products are based on USP chapter 2232 for dietary supplements. And there appears to be no justification why this is the case. And finally, the topical values are based on FDA limits for heavy metals in cosmetics. Next slide, please. Here are the limits for Connecticut. They're defined a little differently because they're based on microgram of heavy metal contaminant per kilogram of user body weight per day. So it's very difficult to get a good understanding what this means with regard to maximum daily consumption because it is only based on the body weight of the consumer. However, in toxicology studies, very often a typical body weight of 60 to 70 kilogram is used, but you still need to know what is the recommended consumption per day of cannabis products to make the calculation of the heavy metal maximum allowable limits. So it makes sense that if, you, if you're a cannabis consumer in Connecticut, you have to weigh yourself before you consume cannabis. That's a joke, by the way. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> So let's talk more about the PDEs defined in USP chapter 232. Here is the full list of USP chapter 232 limits, which are based on maximum limits in microgram per day for 24 elemental impurities in the drug compound per delivery method. So for a suggested maximum daily doses of 10 gram, these limits should be divided by 10. No chapter 232 limits are the same as the ones defined in ICH Q3D guidelines for elemental impurities. For those of you not familiar with ICH, there's a consortium representing the global pharmaceutical industry, including the United States, European, and Japanese pharmacopoeias. A few points to make. 
These PDEs have all been determined using toxicology studies based on well-established animal models, which are fully explained in the ICH guidelines. They made recent changes to a few of the elements, which are shown in red, based on updated toxicology data. Each elemental impurity is classified based on its likelihood of being found in the drug manufacturing process, which is shown in the second column. I will discuss more about uh, the classification later on in my presentation. Next slide, please. Hey, Robert, and yes. in testing beyond the big four heavy metals, what should operators request to the labs? La and uh, in the case of the labs, the transparent labs, the labs that are doing their work with integrity? Well, of course, it depends what state they're in. I mean, you know, New York will automatically uh, monitor nine heavy metals, whereas California, for example, only requires four heavy metals. My, okay, my advice to a conscientious uh, consumer or someone who's concerned about a wider panel, um, and I'll talk about it later on in my, in my presentation, but a number of the standards organizations are uh, expanding the elemental panel to up to 15, and in some cases up to 23 elemental contaminants. So I will discuss that later on in my talk. But there's, okay, my advice to you is um, read many of my publications because I have put out compelling evidence that at least 15 elemental contaminants are required if you wish to have a comprehensive understanding of heavy metal contaminants in your products. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I, I think it does, and it doesn't come directly from me, but okay, we will follow great. up. Yeah, yeah. I'd, uh, I talk, uh, I discuss that a little more detail later on. Um, okay, so I like to give a little background of the United States Pharmacopeia because for the past 20 years, um, I have been the ACS um, Heavy Metals Task Force leader um, on the Region Chemicals Committee, and I work very closely with the United States Pharmacopeia. So I've got a, a a very good understanding of how USP works. And I think it's always good to explain United States Pharmacopeia because a lot of people don't know who they are and don't understand how they work. Anyway, the USP is an independent nonprofit organization which is not a part of the US government. However, it works very closely with government agencies, ministries, and authorities around the world. The mission of the USP is to improve the health of people through public standards to ensure the quality, safety, and purity of medicines, dietary supplements, and foods. USP standards have ensured consistency of drug products throughout the world for close to 200 years and are recognized in more than 130 countries. These standards, known as USPNF, United States Pharmacopeia National Formary, is a book of public standards for drug substances and products. The FDA designates the USPNF as the official compendium for drugs sold and marketed in the US, which must conform to these standards to avoid possible charges of adulteration and misbranding. Next slide, please. So what is the USP process to change a standard method? USP continually revises standards through a unique public-private collaborative process, which involves scientists and industry, academia, government, and other interested parties. The American Chemical Society was one of those interested parties that worked very closely with USP to update the test method for heavy metals. As mentioned, I lead the Heavy Metals Plasma Spectrochemistry Task Force on the ACS Reagent Chemicals Committee. The USP test for heavy metals described in USP Chapter 231 was first introduced in 1908 and is very similar to the test described in specifications and procedures for ACS Reagent Chemicals. When we updated our ACS heavy metals test, we wanted to make sure that we aligned it with the USP test. The test relies on precipitation of the metal sulfide in a sample and compares the color intensity to a lead standard. USP felt that it was time to replace chapter 231 with methodology that reflected modern test methods and updated toxicology data. Next slide, please. To put this in perspective, let me tell you a little bit about the limitations about chapter 231. It is based on a sulfide precipitate of the analyte elements using an organosulfide compound and assumes that all analyte metal, heavy metals behave in a similar manner to a lead standard. 
which samples are compared to. It is semi-quantitative at best. It was in initially intended to detect a small group of heavy metals, but there was no clear definition of which individual elements the method was detecting. It is well recognized to have many limitations, but it's pretty amazing that the test has survived over 100 years. Next slide, please. So what are these limitations? Here's a nice visual graphic which explains that. This slide shows the colored sulfide precipitation of 12 different heavy metals. Imagine if all 12 elements are present in the sample, how difficult it would be to compare the color of the lead standard, which is circled in red. Some of its known limitations include, it cannot detect individual heavy metals. Typically five PPM is the limit of detection. It's very labor intensive and the interpretation of the color varies with the experience of the analyst. And it also needs a large sample weight of approximately five gram to work correctly. Next slide, please. And Robert, what, what is an example of picking up some of these other elemental contaminants, excuse me, if, even if we're only testing for big four, like what other processes or equipment should we be further evaluating? Well, if you don't request more than the big four, they, they will escrute the scrutiny of the state um, that's requiring the panel of elements. Um, but the technique that's commonly used to, um, okay, to measure the big four and an expanded panel is ICPMS. And that is the technique that the United States Pharmacopeia and the American Chemical Society has evaluated. So that is considered now the gold standard in doing, I mean, carrying out elemental determinations in any cannabis consumer product. And I'll talk a little bit um, about the 20 year timeline that it took the USP to come up with new method, new ICPMS methods for, um, for pharmaceutical products. But it's important um, that ICPMS is a multi-element technique that can measure the periodic table in a matter of, of, a, of a few minutes. So it makes no difference if you're requiring four or if you're requiring 40 elemental contaminants. It's almost exactly the same time. And in fact, I've written a, uh, a publication in Analytical Cannabis, which compares the time between measuring four heavy metals and measuring 15 elemental contaminants. And the, uh, the difference in cost and the time is trivial. So this slide represents the timeline that the USP took to change the chapter 231 to plasma spectrochemistry. So they started in 1995, where USP identified serious issues with chapter 231. In 2000, they investigated ICPMS as an alternative technique. In 2004, they proved recovery issues with chapter 231 compared to ICPMS. However, it took from 2005 to 2017 with various expert committees, working groups, stakeholder meetings to discuss the change, which the ACS were involved with. And it wasn't in 2018 that they come up with these comprehensive new chapters. Chapters 232 and chapter 233 were approved and aligned with ICH QFD guidelines. And I'll talk a little bit more about these two chapters. Next slide, please. So they wanted a separate chapter for uh, for, for pharmaceuticals only, they call this chapter 232, but they wanted a totally different one for dietary supplements because that's the way they're regulated in the US and around the world. So they gave this um, nomenclature chapter 2232. In addition to that, they had a completely different chapter for the analytical methodology, chapter 233, which included plasma spectrochemistry, microwave digestion, and a comprehensive list of validation protocols. Next slide, please. So what are the potential sources of elemental impurities in drug compounds? Because I think it's important to understand this before you start looking at cannabis consumer products. So in pharmaceutical products, intentional elements are intentionally added as a part of the organic synthesis process. And um, these, are, these are elements which are commonly used or used in the process of, um, of organic synthesis of certain drugs which use platinum group catalysts. So if a drug has been manufactured using a platinum group catalyst, those elements should be eliminated or should be included in the list of 24. 
But if there's no process which involves organic synthesis using these catalysts, there's no need, uh, there's no need to measure them. But also the second category is elements that are not intentionally added that could be present in the preparation of the drug product. Examples of this might include talcum powder, which is primarily used for tablet compression. Talc is basically magnesium silicate, which is mined from the earth. So it can potentially contain high levels of certain heavy metals and transition metals. Third category, elements that are introduced into the drug substance from the manufacturing equipment itself. Examples of this might include the leaching of chromium, nickel, and iron from stainless steel mixing or storage vessels. Fourth, elements that have the potential to be leached into the drug product from storage containers or closure systems. Examples of this might include transition metals in some low quality plastic and glass materials. The bottom line was that regulators require the pharmaceutical industry to have a comprehensive understanding of elemental impurities in drug products by categorizing them by their toxicity and the likelihood of finding them somewhere in the manufacturing process. Since 2018, all manufacturers of pharmaceuticals are liable to be inspected by the FDA at any time and be expected to show data that elemental impurities are below these PDE limits. Next slide, please. Is another example of the manufacturing equipment, something as simple as shears. I, I think this is something that uh, you've published uh, before, but uh, the shears being part of the elemental contamination. Yeah, this was a, this was a study that was done some time ago. Some, uh, some, some regulators in a state found that it was high chromium in a consumer, in a, in a flower, and it was traced back to the stainless steel shears that were actually cutting the flowers up. So, you know, stuff like this, which you wouldn't, normally you know consider a problem um, is a problem in cannabis manufacturing um, okay so let's not talk more about the classification we come into the end of the I've got about another 10 minutes so we're going to go over Trevor do you want me to do you want me to cut it short or do you want to it, well, let's be respectful of everybody's time we should probably cut short but we are indeed continuing these talks and open to uh, Q&A, so we can expand a little bit of time for Q&A. Okay, um, well, let's just talk about this slide briefly, because this talks about the classification of the pharmaceutical products. So they separated the class one, class 2A, class 2B, class three. So class one elements have no, have no place in the manufacturing of pharmaceutical products. Lead, cadmium, arsenic, and mercury serve no purpose in the manufacture. So they should be tested at all times. Class 2A are also elements which should not be present in the manufactured drug products. So they should also be tested at all times. Class 2B elements are the, are the elements which uh, you know classified as in the organic synthesis, so might include the platinum group metals and some of the elements that are present um, if organic synthesis had been taking place. Class 3 would not normally be present in an oral drug, but definitely require monitoring if you're looking at a parenteral or an inhalation drug, and that's important to emphasize because much of the um, much of the cannabis, many of the cannabis consumer products now, the desired mode of delivery is through vaping. So that would be a, a huge requirement in, in the cannabis industry. Next slide, please. So, um, so let's look briefly at the different areas. Okay, let's now go into cannabis consumer products. So I'll uh, you know, try and move through, move through these few slides a little quickly. But basically, I have determined, and I think it's very well accepted, that there are three main sources of contaminants of heavy metals in the manufacturing process, including the cultivation and growing sources, process and manufacturing, and package and delivery. Basically, cultivation and growing, you can imagine what they like. Uh, cannabis and hemp are phytoaccumulators. They're used for uh, remediating contaminated soil. So whatever's in the soil will end up in the cannabis, in the, um, in the plant material, and likely the flower. If it ends up in the flower, there's a good chance it's going to end up in the cannabinoid product. Process and manufacturing, you've also got to look at the extraction process. Different extraction systems will extract different levels of heavy metals. So we know based on the, on the product being manufactured, whether it's an isolate, um, whether it's for full spectrum or broad, broad spectrum, uh, which will be dictated by the cannabis extraction process using the, using the pressure, the temperature, 
and the flow um, will dictate the amount of heavy metals that are extracted and also packaging and delivery devices, particularly vaping pens and inhalers, patches, and actually dropper bottles. There was a case recently where the graduated dropper bottles, um, uh, okay, the graduation marks were made from lead-based ink and the lead-based ink was leaching out of the um, uh, out of the CBD extract. Okay, next slide, please. It's a new uh, perspective to see to sale. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The, the, these are things that the cannabis industry does have very little experience with, and they don't really understand what to look for. And my 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 research over the past three years has gone into this in great depth. Um, so if you look uh, again, um, this is uh, where you might find um, you know contamination in cultivation, indoor and outdoor growing sources. So you find that indoor growing sources are, are more controlled. So you find the heavy metal contaminants. Uh, are lower, but if you're growing a product outdoors, which is which is where you're going to find most of the hemp farms nowadays, um, it's if it's grown in contaminated soil, absolutely guaranteed it'll suck up the heavy metals. Uh, using fertilizers, make sure you use high quality fertilizers because low quality fertilizers made from phosphate rock are notorious for high levels of heavy metals. And even indoors, uh, they're using fish extracts and emulsions as a nutrient nowadays. And those have shown, been shown to contain high levels of mercury. Growth enhancers using nickel and silica have been used and they will escape the scrutiny of state regulators. So just be careful. Manufacturing processing stages, again, the extraction system, um, the, okay, the recipe ingredients, if you're making oral, um, you know, if you're using sort of cannabis consumer products, which are for oral consumption, look at the, the recipe ingredients, whether it's an oil or whether it's a, a food ingredient, and definitely look at the process to, um, uh, you know, to process using stainless steel equipment. And finally, storage delivery systems. Vape, I mean, I've done a lot of work in this field with vape pens, and um, you really got to be careful with these because it's been shown now by researchers out there that there's metal particles. Um, you just store uh, CBD extracts for extended periods of time, and they're corroding the internal metal components and they're finding actually metal nanoparticles in these vape extracts. Okay, next slide, please. Um, okay, couple, a few, um, you know, uh, a few product recalls. And I think it's worth talking about these um, is that they've become, uh, I've, I've tracked about 20 product recalls over the past couple of years. Here's just five of them. Um, uh, uh, three of them, uh, sorry, two of them were um, using extracts. Um, one was using okay, cannabis flower, and two of them were uh, in vapes, and two of them were in Florida, one in Hawaii, one in Michigan, and one in Maryland. So there's been many cases, and this is, this is just a snapshot. Uh, okay, next slide, please. Um, so what is my, okay, what is my um, sort of you know, final delivered message here. The current list of four heavy metals is totally inadequate. No question about that. The states and really have to get to grips with that. And when the FDA comes knocking on the door of the cannabis industry in a few years, whenever it will be, uh, they currently monitor 24 in pharmaceutical products. Clearly four is inadequate. And I don't know the final number. What is a compromise is somewhere between four and 24. And I think it's somewhere between 15 and 16. And, um, I produced a lot of compelling evidence that there's um, that there's uh, that there's a case to really expand that list and uh, to really for the states to start getting proactive and the states that start looking at a wider panel of elements I think are going to be in um, in a much better favor with the FDA when eventually um, you know they come knocking. So um, actually, let's finish here. Oh, okay, I just wanted to emphasize. Um, if you go to the next slide, Trevor. Yep. That um, we see that standards organizations are beginning to cotton on and NIST, NIST is coming out with a hemp reference material for 13 toxic elements. That'll be out this year sometime. I'm on an ASTM um, subcommittee where we're writing a brand new ASTM method for um, ICPMS for cannabis and, can and cannabis infused products. And that will define up to 24, up to 23 elemental contaminants. And recently, USP came out 
uh, a draft monograph for CBD to be used as an API for a federally approved uh, drug formulation, which includes up to 24 elemental impurities. So clearly that's the way the industry is going. And it's only a matter of time before that panel is expanded. Um, next slide, Trevor. Um, a final point to make, and I, I, talk, I talk about this a lot because I'm brought in to discuss um, you know, contamination issues with many cannabis testing labs, um, that the cannabis industry is new. Um, they don't have a lot of experience in working in the ultra trace environment. So make sure if you're looking for a cannabis testing lab, particularly for heavy metals, that they understand working in the ultra trace environment is absolutely critical because some of the inhalation products are pushing the detection capability of ICPMS. So you need a lab and you need personnel who understand how to operate ICPMS and to understand all the contamination issues and all the remedies to prepare yourself get, for getting the, the, the correct result. Make sure that the cannabis is coming, that's coming in into your cannabis testing lab, your, your results are reflected what's coming in. So that's absolutely critical. And final quick question, slide. quick question, and this could go both for both Victor and Robert, but how are investors utilizing risk optimization resources for laboratory investments? Well, um, yeah, you know, that, that, that is a great point. Um, I recently published a four part series. I, I, was, I, was, I kept being asked this a lot and I had nothing really to show them. So I sat down a few months ago and I put together this white paper on, on implementing a comprehensive risk assessment strategy to better understand sources of elemental contaminants in cannabis consumer products. And I based this on my experience of 20 years in the pharmaceutical industry. And I bring the, um, the experience of pharmaceutical industry into my publication. And I lay, out, I, I lay out very clearly how the cannabis industry can implement a risk assessment strategy based on what the pharmaceutical industry took almost 20 years to implement. Um, that publication has just been published. They just published the fourth part of the series and it will be a one part white paper, which is coming out in the next few weeks. I don't know when, um, but um, we can supply the links to the four part series it's it's fairly um, it's fairly involved. It's fairly long. It's about thirty pages in total. But um, it will be a white paper that's available soon. So I present um, experience of the pharmaceutical industry, and uh, um, I think I put compelling evidence forward that the cannabis industry needs to get its skates on and start looking at this problem a lot more seriously. Because as I mentioned, when the FDA comes along, I think we could. Um, you know, I think we could see some issues. But anyway, um, that's my final slide. I just want to put up, uh, okay, the next slide, which shows my three publications that I have out in the public domain. My most recent one is the one in the middle, measuring heavy metal contaminants in cannabis and hemp. This has recently been introduced as a paperback, um, which is a lot less expensive, uh, which is good. <laughs> um, but those three are available um, and they're all available through my, through my publisher or all through Amazon. Um, and I encourage you to take a look at those. I'm not saying you should purchase them, but they're all good resources if you're in this field and you want a better understanding of sources of heavy metal contaminants in many different areas, but in particular, the cannabis industry. So thank you for your time. And I'm sorry, I've gone over um, and I should, have, uh, I should have tried to consult it a little bit, but uh, I care passionately about this topic. And uh, sometimes you can't get it all in um, in a 20 minute talk, but anyway. No need to apologize. Um, thank you very much, Robert. And you know this, I know that we are over, but with the audience that we do have, are there any questions that you'd like to uh, put forward? I know that there was a request for that link. And what we're going to do is put the first session as well as the second session on Control Point's website with uh, the, the availability for the resources and how to really capture these. But uh, is there anything that pops up now to ask either? Trevor, I just wanted to make one point here. Uh, 
that I'm also writing a, a synopsis. One of the questions you asked was, how, does, how do labs use this risk optimization? Well, one of, the, one of the questions that's being asked of many labs is, where do I go with this? How do I develop the right tests for different markets? And one of the things we do, and I've worked with a couple of labs already on this, is look at the, how labs can provide not only uh, guidance in terms of analytical, but also guidance in terms of implementation and streamlining of systems and target areas that will need to be analyzed and provide that guidance to potential customers. And that's a leadership role that a lot of labs are looking for. And so what I'm doing is I'm actually writing a synopsized uh, publication showing how risk optimization can benefit each sec type of uh, organization within the cannabis sector, including labs. Excellent. That quite powerful. And uh, there's uh, a laboratory in Arizona that will probably want to be coordinating a call in the very near future, like next week or the week after, because they're going through another round of funding. But uh, I suppose with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up and uh, be respectful the rest of the time. And again, you know, as questions appear or generate after, please bring them forward. You know, Control Point is here to be a referee in the industry and really take questions from either side and let's find the answers to them. So thank you very much. Uh, we will definitely be having more sessions together and uh, have a great week. I am with ASTM in Seattle for committee week. So if there's anything towards ASTM that comes up, let us know. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Take care.